Thank you so much for coming to see the film. And um, it was a four year journey uh, of making this film, getting to know George and the history and the family. I was in a privileged position as well, making the film as Alexi's partner. Um, but um, as you can see, George was a remarkable, remarkable human being and a great inspiration. Alexi? I just want to say that the film we started in 2019. I got a call from the co director and uh, I said, Well, we know my uh, partner is uh, Jane Lippin, and his response was, uh, oh, She is uh, the consummate filmmaker. Long story short, they did it together. My father was still alive. And uh, it was started off by this one of us in a series of MNET, uh, the major private broadcaster in South Africa and Africa. Um, they were putting an uh, icon series together of famous South Africans. And uh, it was uh, by all accounts a low budget. So, personally, I've learned a lot about the film. Uh, <laughs> Called work and things, and uh, I'm, I'm now doing all sorts of edits and understandings and whatever of, of filmmaking, helping uh, assisting Joe. And then uh, our father died, and I, I got a call from uh, uh, from George O'Neill in Perth, from Perth, Australia, but I met in chaperoning our father in 2010 on the Robin 10 day trip. People in many communities in Australia, Perth, Melbourne, and, and Sydney. And he, there was a call of consideration that, you know, that, that our father died. And uh, I mentioned that we have this low budget film. Um, and he was really upset. He said, can it be low budget? And uh, uh, he called me back in a week later. He said, he said, no, we've got to raise the money. He called me back a week later and said, no, this is all, it's, it's all too difficult. And, he and his brother Basil uh, put in uh, more than double what the local broadcaster put in and uh, um, uh, had together for your, your young brothers who assisted greatly because the film, as you see it, is rich in archive and very expensive um, in the archive licensing. Thank you. We will be meeting Mr. George Yorgio shortly. Um, I would now like to invite Mr. Nicholas Constantinides, the current president of the Cyprus Bar Association, to make a brief address. Ambassador, um, consuls, dear guests, it's with great pleasure uh, that today's event in tribute to George Bezos was placed under the auspices of the Cyprus Bar Association, which I have the privilege of representing today. George Bezos was a fellow advocate and Helen. As we have just witnessed from the documentary, George Bezos was a beacon of legal activism in South Africa's anti-apartheid struggle for democracy, freedom, and human rights. His example and message are much needed in the difficult times the global community is currently facing and the human suffering occurring near and far from us with grave violations of international law. His legacy is significant for us in Cyprus in particular, as we are still the victims of a 50 year long Turkish occupation regime, which similarly is discriminatory and violent. George Bezos reminds us that legal professionals also have a central role to play in the struggle for the restoration of justice, human and civil rights, and the territorial integrity of the Republic of Cyprus. We wish to thank Dinos Dumazos and Agora Dialogue for the opportunity, and we look forward to future collaborations in order to spread the high values that George Bezos also represented. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, could I also now invite Mr. Oz Karahan to say a few words? Mr. Karahan is current president of the World Union of Turkish Speaking Cypriots. Is Mr. Karahan? Yes. Thank 
Good evening, everyone. Uh, I didn't prepare a speech, but I think uh, what I want to say is that George Bezos today uh, probably watching us and seeing that Cypriots in this room uh, came together uh, because I see familiar faces, Greek speaking Cypriots, and I see familiar faces, Turkish speaking Cypriots who today uh, cross barricades in their own country to come here and watch the work of the George Bezos. Uh, there are many uh, moments, many words stuck in my head from the uh, documentary, but one of them was the, uh, the speak that uh, black consciousness movement activists uh, give. He said, we deserve to live in a society where there is no majority or minority. One people, he said. And I believe that everybody, all human beings in the world deserve that in their own country to be one people, to live in a pluralistic democratic society. And everybody deserves to live in a normal state. Thank you very much for coming here. Thank you very much. Um, we'll now have the panel discussion, and I'm, unfortunately, I was going to throw it initially to Eleanor Sisulu in Johannesburg, but I've just been told that she's having trouble uh, connecting. Uh, so uh, we'll hope that she might be able to come in a little bit later on, and we'll move to uh, our second member of the panel, um, Alexi, if you could. <laughs> to you uh, and hopefully we'll have yes we do have George and we have Kliakos so we've got two out of the three which is a, a good start um, I think my microphone yeah that's right um, Alexi Bezos uh, as you already know is George Generate's uh, Bezos' son and managing director of Greencraft Lighting in Johannesburg Alexi um, you were very involved uh, obviously in the making of the film and you've been very active in promoting it around the world. Could you talk to us about why you think it's important to share your father's story, both here in Cyprus and elsewhere beyond South Africa? Um, thank you. Uh, you know, if we look at uh, our father's life, um, firstly, as a refugee, um, many refugees in the world, many migrants, and given the state of the world and conflicts in the world, um, and some say the the prospect of uh, more migration with um, environmental issues and lack of water. Um, and I might say, I'm sure in this room we have, um, I know we have refugees, we have migrants, we have economic migrants. I know that there's some from South Africa come back to South Africa. There are Cypriots who are refugees. So there's a lesson to be learned uh, about uh, refugees and taking care of refugees. Obviously, in the film, it was very difficult to, you know, what you put in, what you put, what don't you put in. There's so many stories and side stories which I won't go into, but certainly. George Bezos, the refugee, um, is a an important one. And I'll just digress just a little bit. About years ago, there were some refugees that landed in the village in Vasilitsi about 15, 20 years ago, on the very same beach that he and his father, the New Zealand soldiers, and a couple of others had left. And... Um, uh, uh, a good friend and activist in the area said, well, you've got to get comment from George Bezos. And um, I want to look up that uh, newspaper cutting in the Kalamata where uh, he was interviewed and uh, George said he hopes that the uh, Greek authorities uh, treat the refugees as well as they were treated um, in, uh, by the Allied uh, soldiers and uh, I mean obviously it was a little bit different but he was a refugee <clears throat> the second thing is it's all around 1948, 1948 was the first year he went to university, 1948 was the 
Declar the, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. 1948 was the National Party coming to power in, uh, in South Africa and enforcing, uh, entrenching apartheid, not that there wasn't segregation before, but certainly entrenched uh, apartheid through for decades. Um, and there was also, uh, he was young, but there were also returning soldiers from us, the Second World War where, who had special, special privileges to go to study and they didn't want this to happen again. Um, and so when you look at it, the lessons are that, uh, you know, that, that there was certainly a fight against injustice, which finally was triumphant. Um, and the other lesson is that, and for those countries uh, where the conflicts seem intractable and solutions seem very distant, um, coming from South Africa, I was outside of South Africa. I'd refused to serve in the military and uh, refused, South Africans refused to renew my passport. I was outside the country. I was outside the country from 84 to, to 92. But there was certainly little hope in the 80s as things were going that there would be a solution. And there was a solution. And the question is, where and around what was the solution? And the solution was a Bill of Human Rights, constitutionalism, the rule of law. If you protect the individual, you don't need all sorts of um, uh, uh, minority and majority rights. What you saw in the film uh, espoused by Biko was absolutely revolutionary at the time that he said it. Um, today, when we look at it, it's commonplace. Mm -hmm. um, and today, we're in a world where I think someone was saying, which was uh, Jane, was seventy-two percent of seventy-two percent of people live under dictatorial regimes, and even in our the other twenty-eight percent, um, democracy is under threat, populism is on the rise, judiciary is under threat. Um, and that's the, these are the lessons. Yeah. Thank you. Jane, if I could move on to you. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> um, Jane Pittman is, of course, the uh, director, co director, and, and executive producer of the film. Uh, she's a film and TV director and also a journalist. Uh, she has worked for the BBC and uh, Channel 4 in the UK and for the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation for, I believe, 10 years. Uh, and she's currently based in Johannesburg, where she works with a leading South African investigative current affairs program, a TV program called Carte Blanche. Jane, George Bezos remained resolute uh, mm. in his mission to hold government to account, both during apartheid uh, and in the democratic era since 1994. And he tells us in that very poignant moment at the end of the film that he remains optimistic about the future of the country. What do you see as the main issues uh, facing post-democratic South Africa? And how do you think telling the story of George Bezos can contribute towards resolving some of these issues? Um, South Africa is currently a country in crisis. And, what, you know, the things that George Bezos upheld, which were the rule of law, you know, um, successful prosecutions, a fight against corruption, education of the youth, um, um, you know, all the, we need to do all of these things. So many of the things that George Bezos promoted and talked about and did, we actually need to be doing in South Africa today, we need to prosecute people when they are doing things that are illegal. We actually need to follow through on that. We need to be, we need to, we need to be, to be, to be fighting corruption in a very real, we, real way. We need skilled people coming into the country. Um, so George is an inspirational example. He's a, he's a, he's an inspiration to me. He's an inspiration to many people I know. And he can help us continue for for a fight for a, for a, for a just South Africa. So that's why I think it's important to try to show this film and to 
talk to people in different communities about it. So was the, the concept of the film very much conceived in the context of what's happening in today's South Africa? Was that a conscious you know, part of your motivation? The, the concept was to look at famous South Africans, icons who were seen to be particularly important in the society. And then obviously in the society in crisis, people like A. George Bezos or you know, Nelson Mandela or various other people become, be, as we said, beacons of hope you know, that we can look at and say, where did we go wrong? What should we be doing? How can we do it? What does the Constitution represent you know, for us? How can it if, help if us? I may add, um, part of the brief was to also focus on the youth. And it's very clear that, um, you know, this whole maxim is, you know, if we learn anything from history, we don't, uh, we learn nothing from history. Fortunately, the youth today in South Africa don't really understand where we come from. Some say, you know, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was a waste of time. Uh, some of us believe it was a very good exercise. The fact that the there was a there was a, a deal done where the prosecutions weren't done uh, weren't done, which are now being pushed. There's the political will to try and push them, but it's so late in the day. People perpetrators are dying off is another thing. So you know, youth. Part of the brief was to focus for, on on the youth, and we hoped. Some have said in the limited showings we've had in South Africa that this should be shown to every high school uh, student and uh, uh, learner and every uh, university student. And we hope to do that in, in South Africa. Which seems to... Uh, George is here, yes. We've lost Kriakos. But I think we have, we have a few moments now where if anybody in the audience would like to ask a question of either uh, Alexi or, or Jane before we move to the next uh, three speakers, this, uh, this is your opportunity. Please. We're in the moment. If you have a, a question, mm -hmm. if you could make it brief and, and, and direct it to a specific person. Does anybody have a question about the film no, or British, about no. George? There's a question. There is? There, up there. Oh, thank you. The opportunity. Uh, Martin Luther King said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. What we live today with the wars, the destruction, while it is easily, actually, I want to share with you to start the debate. I have an article which was published in the Foreign Affairs for legal, civilized ways to solve problems, avoid wars and destruction. Because all that we live in our times is related to injustice anywhere, is a threat to justice everywhere. Hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, please. I can hear you. <laughs> Or you fight back. I mean, if, uh, if the question is to us, uh, I think it's for for Cypriots to answer that. Um, uh, personally, I feel coming from far, first visit to Cyprus, having studied the issues in Cyprus, having related... My, our father came here, I think, in 74, 75, um, as a leading Hellene with the Greek um, a representative of the Greek government, um, I think it was the Unity government, uh, to to visit uh, visit the refugee camps, and was very and coined the phrase in uh, 
in uh, protest since in Johannesburg saying we will not rest until the last Turkish soldier leaves um, leaves uh, 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 leaves Cyprus. But you know, it's really not for for me to say, other than to say, from my own personal experience, having been born in South Africa, seeing the conflict, living it, living growing up in the apartheid era, which was brutal, then leaving and then seeing from afar what was happening and more and more bloodshed in South Africa. I never thought I'd go back there. Um, and something happened and there was a collective of people with a political will to come to a solution. Um, and uh, all I can give you is that hope. We Sorry. might. This lady wants to say one more question, then we'll move on. Yeah. Thank you. And mine was just a thank you because I lived through the apartheid years. I've been away since '85, and even though I consider myself a woke person, this brutal reminder of what we lived through reawakens this thing that we lived through it, but we can live beyond it. But we need the political will. And South Africa was helped by Nelson Mandela and uh, de Villiers that saw the light and said, I don't really have a choice and there's only one way forward. So to me, they, even no matter how woke you are, if you don't have the political will or the leadership, yes. then, and, so, and thank you very much because it did remind me of those brutal years that we tend to have put in the back of our heads. But thank heavens that people do sometimes move on. So thank you. Thank you. Um, we, I, I want to, I'll move on now and then at the end, after the next three, uh, we'll come back to some questions. Okay, so you could hang on to that one. Um, I, it looks like we still do not have Elena from Johannesburg. So if I could move to, uh, to you, Kliakos. Um, Dr. Kliakos Kiriakidis uh, has had a distinguished academic career in the UK and in Cyprus and is currently Senior Visiting Fellow of English Law and Legal Practice in the Law School at the University of Central Lancashire in Cyprus. Now, of course, uh, there are some key distinctions and principles which lie behind the injustices of the apartheid regime in South Africa and which have much broader application. I think some of them have been mentioned already. One is the distinction between law and justice, as Martin Luther King wrote in his letter from Birmingham City Jail in 1963, an unjust law is no law at all. Another is the critical importance of the general principle of equality before the law. Uh, as a legal academic, how do you see the importance of these issues, uh, bearing in mind how international law deals with apartheid? Good evening. Can I first double check that you can all see and yes. hear me we can see you and hear you yes <laughs> thank you uh, i begin by expressing my gratitude to all those involved in the production of george bezos icon the film was riveting moving and inspiring i also thank dr webb for advance notice of a question which interrelates with the observations made by the gentleman in the audience a few moments ago now, in my capacity as a legal academic affiliated to a or a dialogue, I'd like to respond to the question by offering some purely personal reflections on three matters. The first is an idea. What is laid down in a constitution or in legislation may represent the law of the land, but that law may not be just or may not be seen to be just, particularly if the law is abused by any regime with the aim or effect of unfairly discriminating against, segregating, oppressing, or otherwise dehumanizing any individual citizen or group of citizens. Some of the origins of this idea lie in the ancient Greek thinkers whose writers form part of the intellectual foundations of democracy, ethics, and what is known in Greek as dogrados de Gil, and in English as the rule of law, or as I prefer to call it in the light of Dr. Martin Luther King's letter from Birmingham jail, the rule of just law. For decades, apartheid was the organizing principle behind the law of South Africa. Eventually, however, apartheid came to be universally seen as so unjust 
that it had to be rooted out of the legal framework and constitutional culture of South Africa. In the struggle to expose apartheid for the inhumane and indeed repugnant system that it was, lawyers such as Bizos were closely involved. Indeed, his career underlines that without moral courage, allied to professional ethics and a sense of what is truly just, any lawyer may end up simply being an agent of oppression or an accomplice to wrongdoing. The second is a general principle of fundamental importance which is synonymous with the campaign waged by George Bizos, equality before the law. Any form of segregation or apartheid, which is a variation of segregation, has the innate potential to discriminate, degrade and cause inequality. Thus, in Article 3, the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, as adopted on the 21st of December 1965, the 182 states parties particularly condemn racial segregation and apartheid and undertake, I emphasize that verb, undertake to prevent, prohibit and eradicate all practices of this nature in territories under their jurisdiction. The third is a reality. Today, apartheid is widely regarded as being a crime, indeed a crime against humanity. According to the United Nations, according to the United Nations, 109 states have become parties to the International Convention on the Suppression and Punishment of the Crime of Apartheid, as adopted 50 years ago on the 30th of November 1973. Meanwhile, 124 states have become parties to the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, as adopted 25 years ago on the 17th, 17th of July 1998. In the Rome Statute, apartheid is expressly listed as being one of the acts capable of constituting a crime against humanity. And now I come to the elephant in the room. Turkey is among the states to have refused to sign, let alone become a state party, to both of these instruments of international law. This is in contrast to Australia, the UK, my, my country of birth, and the Republic of Cyprus, as well as Greece and other states which have become parties to the Rome Statute. Needless to say, that stance forms part of a much bigger picture on the one hand, Turkey is a former colonial hegemon of Cyprus, and along with the UK and Greece, one of the three guaranteeing powers, which in 1960 preserved a pre-existing Ottoman British colonial system of segregation upon the establishment of the Republic of Cyprus. When it was born, therefore, the Republic became saddled with an intrinsically divisive, and I would argue unjust constitution, which not only segregated the people into what it called the two communities, consisting of members of the Greek community and members of the Turkish community, respectively. That unjust constitution also recognized, revived, or introduced several structures of segregation. Among these are segregated communal primary schools at the very basis of society, the Greek uh, communal electoral list, and the Turkish communal electoral list, to use the terms in the on the other hand, since invading the Republic of Cyprus in 1974, Turkey has de, de facto imposed a variation of apartheid under which members of the Greek community, in inverted commas, uh, as, as per the phraseology of the Constitution, have been forcibly segregated and kept physically apart from members of the Turkish community, the latter of whom have been de facto herded into an occupied, ethnically cleansed and colonized area characterized by UN Security Council Resolution 550 of 1994 as the occupied part of the Republic of Cyprus. All of which, and I'm, I'm reaching the end now, all of which has de facto engendered systemic and normalized forms of segregation, supremacism, and inequality, which must be uprooted from every inch of the sovereign territory of the Republic of Cyprus just as apartheid was eventually uprooted in law from South Africa. Apartheid was replaced by a new constitution, which George Bizos helped to compose. Its first three words, we, the people, 
mirror the first three words of the US Constitution, but they are conspicuously absent from the Constitution of the Republic of Cyprus. In closing, therefore, I encourage everyone to draw inspiration from the life and career of George Bizos. I also encourage everyone to read his books, including his memoirs. They are evocatively entitled Odyssey to Freedom. I thank you. Thank you, Kliakos. I, I suspect there will be some comments and, and, and questions uh, at the end uh, of this session for you, uh, but if they could uh, just hold those for the moment and we'll move, move on to Professor Christos Kleridis. Are you going to join us? Um, Professor Kleridis is an advocate here in Nicosia and in the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. He was president of the Cyprus Bar from 2020 to 2023, a member of the House of Representatives from 2001 to 2006, and a member of the National Council from 2001 to 2004. He's currently Professor of Cyprus Law and head of the Frederick University Law Department. Professor Kleridis, uh, as an expert in Cypriot legal history, do you see parallels between the struggle for freedom and human rights in South Africa, in which George Bezos and his colleagues uh, played such a courageous role, and the Cypriot struggle for independence in the 1950s? First, allow me to uh, congratulate the director and all the um, participants to the making of this excellent uh, film. I think it's a film which must be watched uh, by law students, by the younger people. Uh, there are a lot of uh, lessons to be learned from this uh, film, and I'm grateful for this opportunity uh, to have watched uh, uh, the film and uh, comment uh, on uh, Mr. Pizzo's life and certain aspects relating to it. When I was watching uh, the movie, the scenes uh, from the Mandela and other trials, the Warnian trial, um, were reminiscent of the trials we had here in Cyprus in the 50s, uh, when Cyprus was under the English yoke, colonial yoke. One particular uh, uh, case which I commented and wrote articles about is the Karaulis uh, case. Uh, a young man who was uh, hanged by the British justice at the time uh, falsely accused of uh, murdering a police officer, a Cypriot police officer at the time. Uh, it was a classic case, as I wrote, of uh, judicial murder. The evidence was based on uh, uh, two lying uh, witnesses who were paid by the colonial government to uh, uh, tell lies in court. This was discovered recently in uh, documents uh, I uh, had the chance to see uh, in the context of another trial that was taking place recently in uh, the High Court in, in, of England. And it is admitted that it was a classic case of judicial murder. Uh, so here you have uh, a justice which was not justice. And, and this is the history of uh, uh, upper height in uh, South Africa and the struggle of... Uh, uh, business and advocate uh, against it, uh, which was successful at the end of the day, irrespective of the weaknesses of the system uh, today. Um, so there are certainly common elements between the struggle uh, of the South African people and the Cypriot people uh, for their uh, uh, liberation from uh, a colonial yoke or from a regime which basically like a foreign regime although South Africa it was like a, a foreign regime. Uh, there were other trials also uh, and the closing remark of uh, Nelson Mandela uh, if needs be to die 
reminded me of uh, Evagoras Palikaridis' uh, uh, remark. He was uh, sentenced uh, and uh, hanged by the British at the time, uh, who uh, ended his uh, trial by saying that I know that you are going to hang me, uh, but I did everything I did for uh, Greece at the time and for, of course, the liberation of uh, Cyprus. So, um, history repeats itself. The struggle for uh, human rights is timeless. Um, it's very strange that uh, we have to struggle for human rights. Um, indeed, <coughs> human rights are deemed to be part of natural law. I mean, we are born with certain rights which are human, but you still continue and you have to struggle all your life to uh, uh, combat uh, against mm -hmm. the violation of uh, uh, human, human rights by government, by uh, people, by uh, ruthless uh, regimes. Um, and it's very important, and I think this is a message of uh, uh, Bezos, uh, never, to, never to give up. And uh, in this respect, uh, the EOCA fighters in the uh, very recent years, 2015, for the tortures they uh, suffered during uh, their custody in the 50s, uh, they referred the case uh, to the High Court of uh, London and they were successful. Uh, in their uh, uh, claims and got compensation. Compensation is not uh, so important as the uh, uh, moral uh, justification. So 50 or so uh, years uh, after uh, the events, uh, they still insisted uh, to pursue their rights. And this is very important. We have a lot of lessons to learn from the South African experience, which also relate to prospects of the Cyprus problem. Uh, it was said in the film, uh, one people, one country, basically. No discrimination and any solution that is based on uh, community or racial or origin uh, discrimination will not be acceptable. And even if it is forced or imposed uh, upon Cyprus, it will collapse sooner or later. So this is a very important lesson for politicians uh, to learn uh, when dealing with the Cyprus uh, problem. Human rights must be at the forefront of any talks for the solution of the Cyprus problem. Thank you. It's very interesting. I, I think um, the need for truth and reconciliation uh, in Australia also is very, uh, very real. Um, so these, there are resonances for all of us uh, here, I think. Also, this uh, commission, this committee, uh, is an example that we can draw upon. Although, as we have heard from the film, uh, at the end of the day, not many prosecutions uh, yes. took place. A very limited number of prosecutions uh, took place. So it's another lesson we have to watch out. Uh, when dealing with such uh, commissions and committees. Thank you very much. Can I just interject there on the last point? And I'm always in defense of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. It did its job. It carries on doing its job. There are still, there are still people today working in the skeleton staff of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission who are doing forensic work in trying to find disappeared people. The fact that the prosecutions haven't happened, and there's now of late, in the last year or two, there's of late some movement now to do that, albeit late, you know, that's a different issue. So... But just to say, as, as um, ex-Deputy Chief Justice Dikha Mosaneki said in the film, the bad guys took over. We had these wonderful people like George Bezos and, you know, the, those activists. But unfortunately, at, some, at, a, at a point, we had politicians that got in that were corrupt, and we have been, um, we have been infused with that corruption throughout the society. 
So the example of a Bezos to continue to struggle against that is terribly important. Yes. I think uh, <clears throat> Mr. Bezos did an excellent work in the, as we have seen in the film, uh, in the Truth uh, uh, Commission. Uh, <clears throat> and justice, at least in the eyes of the people and the general public, came out, irrespective <clears throat> of the fact that at the end of the day, uh, the prosecution failed uh, in its duty uh, <clears throat> to bring before justice uh, the perpetrators of these uh, terrible crimes. But we have to be careful uh, if we are setting up such a truth uh, a reconciliation committee in Cyprus to make sure that the mistakes of the prosecution and the failures of the prosecution do not take place again. This is what I wanted to say. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I just a bit worried about the, the connection seemed to drop out there for a bit, so I'd like to move while we still have you, George. Um, yes. I don't know what time, what time of the morning it is in Perth, but I suspect it's... It's, uh, it's 240, 240, 240 a.m. in the morning. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, Mr. George Yorgio, our next speaker. George practiced law in, in South Africa before migrating to Australia in 1993, where he works uh, in the field of civil lit litigation in, in Perth. He's a very active member of the Hellenic Australian Lawyers Association, and he and his brother, Basil Yorgio, as uh, Alexi told us earlier on, made a major contribution to the funding of the film. George... We've heard a lot uh, in um, both in the film and in the discussion about uh, the importance of the constitution. Could you describe the circumstances surrounding the negotiation of the first democratic constitution of South Africa and the fundamental changes it brought about? Yeah. Thank you very much to all of you. Uh, I'm not an academic like the previous speakers, uh, my friend Claude was Dr. Cleridi, so I'm not as articulate as they are, although I'm a lawyer. <clears throat> Um, uh, it was a privilege for my brother and I to become involved in the documentary. Uh, we knew George Bezos personally. I briefed him as a solicitor in South Africa. And um, uh, although uh, I was not involved in political trials, and of course George's reputation um, was that he was known as a very competent and forceful political lawyer. He was also a very good commercial lawyer, and I briefed him in commercial matters. So that's how I got to know George. My brother Basil was at the Johannesburg Bar at the time, and his mentor was George Bezos, and uh, my brother was also, also got involved. At, in fact, George wrote my brother into um, the Saheti school that uh, was so important to George, and to the Hellenic community of Johannesburg. Uh, he wrote to me. My brother was a secretary of the, uh, of the Saheti school. And I, I personally believe that George had ambitions for my brother to take over from him um, uh, in the Saheti school. But my brother and I migrated to Australia. So I'm sure that disappointed him. In any event, um, um, I, I, in the interest of saving time, I'll be brief and um, uh, and perhaps even a little superficial, but if there are any questions, I'll be very happy to deal with them later if I could. So the first democratic uh, constitution of South Africa was adopted in 1996. This was not only a turning point in the history of the struggle of democracy in South Africa, but also a significant historical event in world history. Indeed, in my peaceful transition of South Africa from apartheid to democracy was arguably one of the political miracles in the second half of the 20th century, up there with the unification of Germany and the bringing of democracy to countries in the Eastern Bloc, some of the countries in the Eastern Bloc. The recent disappointment in South Africa South Africa's failure to live up to expectations should not detract from the tremendous achievement that people like George Bezos, Nelson Mandela and others in the freedom struggle had achieved 
in uh, creating this constitution and the peaceful transition of transfer of power from uh, a which was really a dictatorship or, or totalitarian white minority rule to democracy without bloodshed. That in itself was a tremendous achievement. And we should not um, detract from that success by some disappointment. And we have to be honest, there has been some disappointment, but we still have optimism, as George Bezos said in, in the concluding part of the documentary, that South Africa will find its way. After all, it has a, one of the finest constitutions in the world. Uh, uh, constitutional scholars have praised the new constitution of South Africa, which has a, a bill of universal human rights at its core as a brilliant constitution and answer to uh, a problem that could have got out of hand in South Africa. White minority rule, a form of totalitarianism, lasted for so long because of the violence and imitation, intimidation that was brought to bear by the is, on the non-white population of Africa to maintain order and compliance. At times, in the decades of violent oppression, it seemed that revolution could end, was the only, was the only way to end the apartheid regime, which was backed by the most powerful police force and army in Africa and was destined to fail on purely military grounds. The prospect of South Africa going up in flames was real at times. It indeed got very close to it in the late 80s and the early 90s. Right until the end, even during the negotiations, secret right-wing elements in the police and defense forces surreptitiously stoked widespread violence and killings between Inkatha, Zulu supporters and ANC supporters to destabilize the country and, and prevent peaceful change. The Nazi-inspired AWB, the Africana Resistance Movement, formed a militia to resist majority rule and committed random acts of violence. A white fanatic, Clive Bobby Lewis, paid an assassin to murder Chris Harney, a significant leader in the, of the ANC, right-wing revolt against majority rule. In the film, you saw a bit about Chris, about um, Clive Darby Lewis and the assassination of Chris Harney. Harney's assassination, assassination over Easter in 1993 was arguably the closest that South Africa came to a revolution and widespread in, in, insurrection. South Africa was at risk of becoming ungovernable. Darby Lewis's amateurish, amateurish and simplistic plan was that Harney's murder would lead black people to attack white civilians. In the resulting chaos, the army, the police and right-wing political leaders would take over. They would declare total war against the black population. A war which the whites were willing to win because of military superiority, thereby saving South Africa from black domination. South Africa, a former British colony, became a republic in 1961. It had become a self-governing British dominion in 1910, like Canada and Australia before it. At the heart of the government, were laws that treated population groups according to their race, which would absolutely, de absolutely determine what rights and privileges members of particular population groups would enjoy. Immediately after birth, every child born in South Africa 
was officially qualified, uh, classified into one of four racial groups by law. The classification determined whatever rights you had to vote, what property you could own, where you could live, where you could travel, where you could work, where you could study, who you could marry or have sexual relations with, which bus, taxi or train you could catch, which restaurant or cinema you could go to, and so on. Under the new constitution, there is no classification according to race or group. This self-serving relic of, past, of a past colonial era, era improved and perfected by the new Africana ruling class after 1948, had no place in a new democratic society. It was a ruse used to claim protection of group rights, a code for securing white privilege. So during the negotiation, where George Bezos represented the, the ANC as a political party, for a new constitution, arguments were raised such as we need to protect rights. We need to safeguard minorities. What about the artificially created so-called tribal homelands? What about areas where local groups would have more autonomy? What about a federation? The ANC was adamant. No such safeguards were required. There would be a united South Africa where every citizen's human rights would be protected under the Bill of Rights, which would be safeguarded by a specifically established, fully independent constitutional court. And individual rights in a unitary state did not have to be protected as part of a group, whether racial or not. Individual equal rights were all achieved, all the protection needed. As one of the drafters of the Constitution, George Bezos traveled the world with his colleagues and, studies very, and studied various constitutions of different countries. He was wary of, the, of a federal system for it could encourage su succession as was a case, as, as was a case in Canada so he always argued for the need of a strong central government in a unitary state and limited local powers. The South African constitution has been universally praised by constitutional scholars throughout the world for its fairness and equity. It was a phenomenal achievement by any standard, considering the resistance faced from those with interests to protect and the concessions that needed to be made from, the, from some of the parties for consensus to be reached. At its core, put simply, was the Universal Bill of Rights. Bezos speaks of Mandela's insistence that the Constitution was not to be written for the benefit of any party but for the benefit of all South African people. Knowing that the ANC was going to win the democratic elections, this was a magnanimous gesture, which, uh, magnanimous and fair gesture. Um, I, I don't have much time, so I'll conclude uh, by saying that uh, there were dark times in Bezos's life, particularly in the 60s and the 70s, where I'm sure he wondered whether democracy would ever be achieved in South Africa in his lifetime. But I'm sure his conviction and optimism in the general goodness of humankind led him to believe that it would. I'm reminded of the Greek saying, it may be a religious saying, I'm not sure, to aviko pote then evlogite, injustice is never blessed which by extension means that it never lasts forever. George Bezos was at the coalface of the making of South African history at every important moment for over 40 years. He was there when 
the freedom struggle began in earnest. Earnest. He participated in the fight against apartheid in very difficult circumstances. It cost him professionally and socially. And he played a, a pivotal role in the peaceful and negotiated transfer, transformation of South Africa to democracy, a dream thought impossible at many times, at times by many. Thank you. Thank you, George. Thank you. Yeah. We do, uh, before we close, have a few moments for those of you who've been so patient. Um, we would like to ask a question. I think there was one here. You still have have, the, have a question? No? Um, does anyone else have a question? It's one over here. If we could keep, if you could keep the question quite short and tell us who it's directed to. Um, do you need a microphone? Yeah. Sorry? I have a question. Can we start here? Sorry. Yes. A very simple and straightforward question. Uh, because I saw a um, documentary about the um, Truth and Reconciliation Committee a few years ago in Amsterdam. And uh, there were, outside of the screening of this film, a lot of uh, uh, people disagreeing. Because I, the, I understood then that the scope of this committee was just to uh, unveil truth, but not to punish. It was just for people to find out what happened to their loved ones who were just taken away, killed in cold blood, and nobody knew anything. So this encouraged people to come forward and say, yes, I killed 20 young people. Because I, uh, we heard that in this village they were going to start uh, something against uh, the ruling uh, situation. We took them in a car, in a, in a van. We told them we are going to join another group. And we just threw them down the, the hill. And they were all killed. And nobody ever heard about it. Now I understand that there is a new uh, scope that you have to... Uh, uh, find these people and ask them to not just uh, tell the truth, but if they admit that they committed these uh, crimes, they have to be pay. Is this the case or is it changing the course? Yes, please Thank do. You. Alex, yeah. you want to say? Yeah, so in t the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was a very serious law that was passed through Parliament and uh, and George Vizos was one of the chief architects of the law. And it was very specific. It had certain criteria. So in order to, it had, it had multidimensional um, uh, purposes. The one was for people to come forward, victims, to tell, uh, to register that they had been aggrieved and that they and persons close to them had been killed or disappeared or injured or tortured, or those people themselves had been tortured. So on the one side, the aggrieved came forward. On the other hand, perpetrators were invited to come and tell the truth about their perpetration of human rights abuses, killings, assassinations, whatever. But there were other criteria, such as it had to be proportionate so that if you are a village and you're my neighbor and you tell me that uh, I'm a communist and I shoot you, um, uh, that's not proportionate. So the action had to be proportionate. It had to be one where you're a member of a recognized armed formation. So you couldn't come up and say, oh, well, I was uh, this tendency of that party or whatever, and I had my little uh, cell of revolution, or I was a, a right-wing Afrikaner or other racist of having this little group. So you had to be a, a, a part of the state or a recognized political... So there were a whole lot of criteria. Mm -hmm. So people, the perpetrators had to apply for amnesty and they would receive amnesty if all these criteria were, were, um, were approved, matched, 
and that uh, they told the whole truth. And if they were if they were heard as they were heard as in some of the clips that you saw in the film, and the commissioners who were headed by uh, Archbishop Tutu and with other legal experts or whatever, if they decided that they were not telling the truth, then they would not be granted amnesty. That doesn't mean that they were summarily punished. It was up to the prosecuting authority, and it's still up to the prosecuting authority, post the Truth and Reconciliation Committee, Commission, to make the prosecutions. And we've had some movement in the last year or two, and one of the one of the first cases that came up with one of the with the uh, with the Timol inquest, um, where you saw the Timol on the, was that uh, our father George went to court. We were a little bit apprehensive. He was in his eighties, but he went. He was very active until at ninety. He was going to his office. He handed in the whole book, no one to blame, as an exhibit, and he was cross examined. He was he was led by the lawyer um, in in when in the reopening of the inquest of Timol, and he also said, no one ever, no one, he made accusations, he made deductions about certain perpetrators, no one ever sued him for libel, when that book was published in the late late nineties. They had every opportunity to say, sorry, Mr. Bezos, you forced me accusing me. Yes, um, thank you, thank you, Alexi. Um, we have time for two more questions. One over here with the microphone, and then that's three. <laughs> okay. Hello. Good evening. We'll see good evening. My name is Similis from the Green Party. First of all, I would like myself also to thank all those who contributed in having this film, and also the organizers of this event. Um, I have not a question, but mainly a comment. It's inevitable to try and make any correl some correlation with Cyprus issue. Earlier, we heard that uh, question whether there is a political will. Further to this, or before this, we need to have a vision supporting human rights. And this is what we, we, we lack of, to my opinion. Thank you. Okay. Here. Thank you. I would also like to congratulate uh, all those involved for producing this documentary, which is certainly very inspiring, very moving, and I would say also very educational. And I would uh, really would like to see uh, that this will be seen by many young people, uh, students from high school or uh, at the university level. Uh, because they can draw conclusions about what you have to do to defend human rights and uh, never give up in doing that. Um, it seems that it was certainly a very difficult task to get rid of apartheid. But it seems after succeeding in that, it was probably easier to introduce laws, change, establish institutions, uh, but, but what it comes out is more difficult to change people's minds, to change people's behavior. This is the most difficult part, and I think that seeing this film helps in doing that. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Achilles Dimitriadis. I want to congratulate our dialogue and um, everyone who contributed to this fantastic film. Uh, I think it should be shown. People should see it. Um, I draw inspiration from uh, George Bezos. I draw inspiration from what I've heard uh, today. And I want to take that inspiration and bring it into Cyprus uh, because defending human rights is not enough. You need to enforce human rights. So you need to take action. And of course, it's great taking action on various matters, but I want to focus on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of South Africa. And I want to draw a parallel to the efforts in Cyprus to have a Truth Commission. The issue of immunity has been settled in Cyprus in 1990, contrary to popular belief. The two attorney generals of both sides of the Green Line have granted a blanket immunity from prosecution for everyone who gives evidence in the um, Committee of Missing Persons. So that issue 
in a way, has been settled, even though people don't know about it. The issue now is, are we going to move on from a committee of missing persons in which 2002 um, missing persons are still there, only half of them, uh, their remains have been identified? Are we going to take that step forward and make a truth commission for the missing as a test of whether this country can take a truth commission. And for me, that's the challenge. And Agora Dialogue, I think, could take that challenge and organize such a splendid meeting as this one for something like this, which I think is the sequel of what we have seen today. And for me, the inspiration drawn has been enormous. And I thank you all for this uh, great experience that you have given me. So thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, just checking the time. We do need to be out of here by 9.15. We're doing reasonably well. So... Ah. Oh. Oh, goodness. Oh. Oh, okay. But I don't know. So, but we can't see her either, but she's, but she can speak to us. Can she speak to us? <gasps> no, well, I don't yeah. know. Um, if we can't hear her, we can't really do much. What is the time? Um, it's 2107. I'll just send her a message. Oh. I don't think we can, we, if we can't hear her, I've we can't. her a message. Okay. What a shame. What a shame. Um, if, I, if I can just talk to... Would I just say something yes. about Eleanor? Yeah, you said it. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, Eleanor, Eleanor Sisulu is the daughter of um, Walter Sisulu. Daughter-in-law. Daughter-in-law, daughter yes. Of Walter Sisulu. <laughs> Walter Sisulu was um, uh, a freedom fighter with Nelson Mandela. There's Eleanor. Hello, Eleanor. Eleanor. Hooray. <laughs> Hooray. <laughs> Eleanor, welcome. I'm so sorry you couldn't be with us uh, earlier. Um, Jane was just uh, saying something about uh, who you are. You are a historian, an activist, a writer. Um, you've written a wonderful biography of your father-in-law and mother-in-law, uh, the Sisulus. Uh, and um, I, was, I, I don't know whether we have time to... Um, I won't even ask you your question. Could you have a quick? Could you make a quick comment? I hope we can hear you. Oh, no. She might be muted. Oh, what a shame. Can you hear us? Can you hear us? No. One of the points Eleanor made in the discussion we had prior to the meeting was with regard to the importance of history and, um, and history in relation to young people as well. Um, do you want to expand on that? Yeah, I, th I think I, I mentioned it, that we have um, in the youth in South Africa, it's... Um, Whilst there's been, there's a huge amount of money spent on education. There's a huge amount of money spent in education. The question is how effective it is. You know, while there are a lot of people getting um, educational opportunities that they didn't have in, the, in apartheid, there's no, our history is not very well taught, nor the general understanding of where we came from. And I think this is what... Um, Eleanor is going to speak to she as an historian. Um, she did write, write a definitive um, um, biography on her late father-in-law, uh, uh, Walter Susulu, who actually was the one who recruited Mandela uh, into the ANC, and he was one of the he was number two accused in the Rivonia trial. Unfortunately. She she seems to have disappeared again. Yeah. Um, that's really a shame. And we do... Okay. I mean, the, the problem is we, we've only got five minutes. Um, George, uh, sorry, Alexis uh, is going to say a few words about his father's uh, or the legacy projects that have been set up in his father's name. So perhaps we could do that <coughs> while we're waiting. Yeah. So 
Um, in terms of the legacy projects, um, there are a few going on. The, the most the one is that the his personal papers, uh, which go for nearly about three hundred boxes now of personal papers, are, are are going to be processed at the University of Witwatersrand. Um, and the Nelson Mandela Foundation has been very helpful, um, and we have an agreement as a family with with the um, with the university to process it, and we hope to also add on to the processing of the personal papers a whole um, uh, indexing of media. If you go to the internet and and you you Google George Bezos, there's hundreds of documentaries, well, hundreds of interviews and that type of thing, um, and also to to really do a thorough background check of all these legal cases, which will come out of the uh, which will come out of the archive, and you know, so that's uh, and and so there's that project. Um, there's also discussions around instituting a uh, a George Bezos memorial lecture. Um, which is a mammoth task. Uh, it sounds very easy, but to sustain it uh, in, in perpetuity is going to be difficult. Um, the other thing is that the Legal Resources Centre, which he spent his last uh, 20, 20, 30 years uh, working in, uh, instituted the George Bezos Human Rights Award, and we, um, we a few people have been... Uh, awarded that, and it will be every couple of years that that's awarded. Um, and uh, the last thing is uh, is that we have, um, well, there's this George Vizosetti Scholarship and Bursary Fund, which uh, he personally put in 50,000 rands. It was quite a bit of money, certainly for him at the time. Um, and thankfully, we've raised um, monies, uh, through dinners and other donations uh, at Saheti School for scholarships. Um, and uh, we have uh, in the foyer, I think a lot of them have been sold and the proceeds will be going to the George Bezos Saheti Scholarship and Bursary Fund. Um, uh, these three copies of his three books, uh, the first one, No One to Blame, which was referred to in the movie, uh, and then the second one was his autobiography, Odyssey to Freedom. And the third one was 65 Years of Friendship, his friendship with Mandela. So um, that's these are kind of timeless books which we hope to distribute worldwide, which are being in some parts distributed um, and to, to honor his legacy and for people to be informed. So you're invited to please, if you want to buy, and also to make any donation to the fund, you'll get a receipt and the Agora Dialogue, as I've discussed with Tino, will be remitting the monies to uh, to the George Vizos Sehiti Scholarship and Bursary Fund. Okay, thank you, Alexi. Um, well, I Sorry, if I also may just uh, thank on, on our behalf, Jane, yeah. the Agora Dialogue. I just wanted to thank Dino's and yourself and everybody who's attended. And thank you for sort of inspiring us again for your react from your reaction to the film that we've made, because this is precisely why we made the film, in order to take it out into communities where there are issues and conflicts. And, you know, that you have responded in this way is extremely gratifying. Thank you. Well, <laughs> so, uh, thank you. Well, on behalf of all of us, thank you, Jane. Thank you, Alexi, for um, a beautifully rounded portrait of a very complex man, a, big, a very big man, uh, set against a set of very big events. Uh, for me, what, what I found so extraordinary was that you allow us to follow his journey from learning to know what is right to learning to do what is right. And, how, and the emphasis he puts, as we've, as many as have said, on we have to be, we have got to be doing what is right. How he became a man who protests, a, a betuga, I believe the word is. So thank you very much for that, and thank you everybody for coming tonight. It's a Saturday night at a very busy time of the year. We hope you have enjoyed it, and uh, we hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. And kalispera ke kalisinekia.
Agreed. Oh, she was there. People stayed, eh? She had some. Well. Okay. 